Good morning to everybody. It's nice to be back here with you. And uh, I know that I have been, I'm supposed to be here one time when I was not able to because of illness. So, but in reality, the message that I will be giving to you today has been interrupted and it was rescheduled four times because of various reasons. It was a message that was given to me, requested to me last December 31. The very last Sabbath of the year 2022. And it was really a very stressful message that I should give because it was at the very threshold of the changing year. And I was wondering, what kind of message should I give? So I decided to discuss about what we should do as we serve the Lord for the coming year, especially with our new pastor. I decided to take reflection from the seven churches of the book of Revelation. Because I can use that as our criteria for evaluating ourselves and make an assessment of how we can work together with our new pastor. For after all, the Bible says, we are the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, as spoken in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Any Bible examples that we can find from the Word of God were written for our admonition. The seven churches are symbolic of the Christian church in the different periods of Christian era. God has sent message after message to give light upon the written word, and they were intended to correct errors, to rebuke sin and to reprove sinner. It is the revelation of God the Father to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and signified by the angel that to be given to prophet or disciple John for our admonition. But before I begin, I like to, with a message, I like to begin with a word of prayer. Our precious loving Father in heaven, how grateful I am for the opportunity that in spite of the interruptions, the long interruptions that interrupted this message, that I am able to deliver it somehow. So I pray that thou will prepare our hearts for the message that you want us to hear, that we may be able to use this as we serve our loving God, to lift up the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. We humbly ask this in his name, amen. So the first church that I would like to begin with is the church of Ephesus that is described in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. In verse 4, the Ephesus church was described as a church that abandoned its first love. We know, my friends, that when we love God, we love others as well. For the Bible says in John chapter 13, verse 35, they will know that we are Christ's disciples if we love one another. My friends, do we still have the same desire to serve God with the same manner that we once did when we first believed? Has our love faded over time? Is our love to God reflected the way how we treat others? 
that we care for others. I'd like to share with you a short story of Robert Robinson. Robert Robinson was the author of the hymn or the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessings. And he wrote this song during his early walk with God in his younger days. But he lost his happy communion with the Lord that, we once, that he once enjoyed. Oh, he traveled the vast ocean, crossed the sea and fly by air, and burned the asphalt road. He lost his relationship with God. He wandered in the, into the byways of sin. And one day when he was traveling, he happened to sit down beside a woman who was attentively reading a hymn or a song. And she was bothering him, try to explain about what she was reading. But you know, Robert Robinson cared less. He doesn't care about anyone. So he just turned his head toward out, to looking toward out the window. But a woman kept on bothering him. Please, what do you think about this song? And so he was able to glance, and he noticed to his surprise that was his own composition. He turned his head again out to outside and looked outside the window and began pondering, meandering about it. And the tears started falling down his face. And when the woman bothered him again, he said, I, I was the one, I am the one who wrote that song. But the woman said, but, but look what you said, the streams of mercy still flowed. Oh yes, my friends, when Robert Robinson went home, he turned his heart back to God again and his joy was restored. My friends, let us keep our first love always aflame. That's the message of the church of Ephesus. So let's go to the second church of Smyrna, found in Revelation chapter two, verse 11, eight to 11. In verse 10, the Bible was described the church of Smyrna as a church under persecution. And the word Smyrna came from the word mer. And beyond doubt, that word sounds familiar to every one of us. It is one of the gifts given to the Lord when he was born. Mer. Mer is a resin with a bitter flavor. But when you crush it, it gives a sweet fragrance. My friends, when we are under stress, when we are suffering, when we are under persecution, persecution within the church or outside the church, how do we react as we witness to the world? How do we react? Are we showing our perseverance, our hope, our faith, or are we showing great disappointment or discouragement? There was a little girl who was supposed to have a minor surgery. And when the, sur the surgery department was almost ready, the doctor told the little girl, you know, I will give you something to lessen your discomfort. You can holler, you can shout, you can cry to the top of your voice. And that is it. As you please. But the little girl responded and said, doctor, would it be all right 
if I will just sing. And that is what she did. She sang until the procedure was over without any groan, tear, or cry. And I believe that that little girl belongs to a Christian. Do you agree? Because I believe that she remembers the story of Paul and Silas. When they were in prison from which there was no escape, what were they doing? They were just singing. Remember? My friends, in times of suffering, persecution, and a great discouragement of life, how do we witness to the people around us? Now let us go to the third church mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, and that is the church of Pergamos. And the church of Pergamos came from the word gamos, which means marriage. And we have read here a while ago about the significance of marriage. It was marked by a spiritual compromise. I'd like to read to you an example of spiritual compromise that was reported by the United Press International from Washington, D.C., 1974. Let me read to you what it says. It was reported that it was declared by the Catholic and the Lutheran Church that they agreed that papal supremacy may no longer be a barrier between their reconciliation. They agreed that the Lutheran moved toward greater degree of acceptance of the papal supremacy that separated them for 500 years. They agreed that the papal bishop or priest can preach or stand before the Lutheran Church to do the functions in ways which are better adapted to meet the needs of the church in the complex environment of the modern times. But this is my question. My friends, have we compromised to be relevant with other faiths? with our own family that are not members yet of our own belief. What things have we compromised in our 28 fundamental belief? Let us think about this, about it. What are we compromising to be relevant with other friends? So let's go to the fourth church, and that is the church of Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2 again, verses 18 to 29. In verse 20, the church was described as a church that tolerated Jezebel. And probably some of you will say, oh, that is not applicable to me because we are not worshiping any idol. We know that Jezebel brought many idols worship to the Israelites. We have Moloch, Baal, Aserat, Astarte, Dagon, Tammuz, many different idols. But I'd like to quote to you what Apostle Paul is saying in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. You have your Bibles, so will you please follow? the reading of what Apostle Paul is talking about in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Say amen if you are ready. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is what? Which is idolatry. In other words, it is telling us 
that uh, in paraphrasing that in Acts of the Apostle, page 317, verse, at paragraph 1, it says here that idolatry meant not only worshiping those idols that I have mentioned a while ago, but it is the worship of self-serving, love of ease, gratification of appetite, passion, and material things. To concern of our status and our personal integrity. My friends, the question I like to ask is, what are the things in our lives that people see as we profess to be Christians? These things, my friends, are idol worship, according to the paraphrasing of Acts of the Apostle, page 317, paragraph 1. Now let's go to the fifth church, the church of Sardis. Now it is in Revelation chapter 3, 1 to 6. It is a church that is described as asleep or stagnant. Anybody here reading our discipleship handbook? Do we read the discipleship handbook? In chapter 9, we will find it there that we have church functions, three important church functions. What are they? The Sabbath school, the divine worship, and what else? The prayer meeting. We should support those important ch church functions. Why? Some people will say, oh, I can just meditate at home. I can just pray to God at home. But we might be missing some important great truth if we keep doing that. Oh, we have been blessed with this technology of seeing our service at home. That is good. That's all right. If we are not feeling well. But if we are feeling well, we should support the church functions. <coughs> Excuse me. What is the significance of the church functions? I like to refer to you to read in Proverbs 27. The one important function of the church is understanding what it says in Proverbs 27. So you have your Bibles, will you please follow the reading again of that verse. Proverbs 27, <coughs> and I'll read verse 17. Please say amen if you find it. Proverbs 27, verse 17. Iron sharpened iron. So a man sharpened the countenance of his friends. You know, my friends, sometimes we take for granted that it is not really that important always to be together in our church functions. But many times we can be instrumental to lift up somebody's burden by just our simple touch our simple words. Oh, we remember the experience of Robert Robinson. Remember? The interaction of the unbeliever, just asking him about the hymn or the song, kept him in tune again with God and made and restored his heart again with the Lord. Your interaction with someone can lift up somebody's, somebody's discouragement. So let us remember that important lesson of, about the church of excuse me, the church of Thyatira. My physical problem is coming up again. So let's go to 
the next church of Philadelphia, the sixth church, is spoken in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to 13. In verse 8, the church was described as a church of brotherly love. Philo means love, and Adelphos means brother, brotherly love. And I like the story that we have heard, although it was not totally completed. <coughs> Thank you, Sister Cheryl. My voice is still hoarse. Brotherly loving church. Are we a brotherly loving church? Do we care for one another? Just like the story of caring for his brother. You know, I saw a picture, a caricature of a church with an open door and people are coming in. Every people coming in. It tells us that there is no white, black, brown, and yellow. They are all, we are all precious in God's sight. We are coming all in. No exception whether educated, less education, poor and rich. But the church was located beside a deep precipice or cliff. And at the back of the church, people are falling down the cliff. And that caricature or picture speaks to me in volumes because I remember a certain passage in the Bible in Ezekiel chapter 34. So you have your Bibles, will you please follow the reading? In Ezekiel chapter 34, where God was denouncing the leaders of Israel. Say, Amen, if you find that Ezekiel chapter 34. And we can read that in verses 3 up to verse 5. But anyway, let me just pick up some words that is very significant to me. In verse 3, God is denouncing the children of Israel, the leaders of the children of Israel, that they were not feeding the flock. Remember what Jesus said to Simon Peter, lovest thou me? Three times, right? And then Jesus said, feed my flock, and then feed my sheep. And the accusation of God to the children of Israel through the prophet Ezekiel was, you are not feeding the flock. Verse 4, the disease have ye not strengthened Neither have ye healed that which was sick. Neither have ye bound up that which was broken. Neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. Neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. So what happened? They were scattered and they were falling away. You know, so you can read the whole verses. But that is the accusation of God to the children of Israel. Are we a loving church? Are we the Philadelphia church? Do we care for one another? That is something that we have to ponder upon to make this church known to others as a loving church. Now, let me go to the last church, the seventh church church of the book of Revelation that is in Revelation 3, 14 to 22. In verse 16, it was described as insipid or a lukewarm church. I will just have to define what is an insipid or lukewarm church. It is an, this unenthusiastic, unguarded, not with fire among other things, you know. Is our church on fire? How do we know if our church is on fire? 
Or we can read in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, it tells us that a church that is on fire is fervent and enthusiastic to do good works. And I believe this church is enthusiastic and fervent doing good works. And I see an encourage really as I look down here. There are so much young people, the hope of this church in the future. For us who are old, we look at you as the one who will carry on the truth, the message of the gospel. Now, I would like to relate to you a story that I read from um, 7,100 Bible illustration about, about a church reporting to the conference. Listen to the statistics. They reported that the number of members added by baptism as zero. They reported the numbers of members added by letter zero. What's the meaning of added by letter? That is just possibly transfer of membership, right? Okay, the number of members dismissed by letter zero. What is the significance of that dismissed by letter? It means we are not paying attention for the members who are not in the congregation for many years, and we don't pay attention to that. We neglect them. We neglect to follow them. So the report was zero. The number of members who passed away, three. The amount of money given to local mission, zero. The number or amount of money given to foreign mission, zero. Oh, we have our foreign mission that we read every quarter, right? Mission offering. So that does not concern us, you know. We have a good number. At, they ended this letter by saying, brethren, pray for us that we continue to be faithful unto the end. This is supposed to be an example of a lukewarm church. But the Bible tells us what happened. The Lord will spit it out, right? And I wish our church will not be like that because this is a living church. Well, my friends, based upon the criteria that I give to you, let us begin to score ourselves. Remember, the title of my message is Inner Scorecard. Let's analyze ourselves if what we have done with those experiences that we read about the seven churches of Revelation. We can give ourselves a scale of one to five if we feel that we failed or five to 10 if we are succeeding. You know, as we look back during the year of 2022, I prepare several questions here as I'm coming close to the message. How do we stand before God, before his judgment bar? What kind of person were you and me in 2022? Do we have the same, do we have some regrets? If we would be able to trace back some parts of the year, how would you and me behave differently? Should have we shown more understanding? Do we still have some desire of serving him, comparing to the first time when we first believed? Should we be more patient and less critical? Should we be more supportive and helpful? Are there things that we could do differently as we serve God? How is our relationship with God? Did it flourish and grow more or did it just hover in the same place? And I hope it didn't go backward. As we are moving on with a new pastor that we have right now, 
It is my prayer that we remember our responsibility that Jesus gave a parable in Luke chapter 13. So I again, I invite you to follow the reading of God. In Luke chapter 13, the parable of Jesus that he gave. Luke chapter 13. And I'll read beginning verse 6. Say amen if you find the text. Luke chapter 16. And I'll read beginning verse 6 to 9. It is a very short parable. It is clear. He spoke also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found what? None. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumber it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Oh, my friends, God wants each one of us to bear fruit. That's the main thing of the parable. The thing that stands out to me in that parable is about the tree. It has two advantages. The first advantage is it is in the vineyard, so it is protected. The second advantage of that fig tree is that it was not planted, it was planted, not planted by chance or by coincidence, but it was planted with a purpose. What's the purpose? The master kept coming for three years and found nothing. That's the purpose, to find some fruit. Cut it down. Why cumber it the land? Oh yes, my friends, found nothing. Fruit of faithfulness, of our faithfulness of taking hold or attending the church functions. Faithfulness of family togetherness. Faithfulness of fellowship, fasting and prayer. For three years, 36 long months, 156 weeks, 1,095 days, 26,280 hours. Diamond studied 60 minutes per hour. 24 golden hours per day. Once they are gone, they are irretrievably lost and gone forever. Nothing to be retrieved. That is, my friends, what this parable about. The master said, chop it down. However, the gardener said, Master, let us give time, another year. What is time? Somebody asked St. Augustine, what is time? And St. Augustine said, um, I know the answer about what is time. But if somebody is going to ask me and define what is time, my answer is I do not know. Why? Because somebody said yesterday was history and tomorrow is a mystery. But today, it is a gift. That's why we call it present. Oh, my friends, Apostle Paul speaks of the importance of time. 
for time makes it is what days are made of. The psalmist, King David, knows about the time. He said, our time on earth is short. We can read that in Psalms 90, verse 10. He said, our life is only how many? Three scores and 10. That is 70. And by reason of strength, our life is four scores, and that is 80. And I praise the Lord that he is giving me that gift of precious life. March 31, I turned 80. But the Lord, the church is blessed in this church to have brother done. Long, long years, you have been a blessing to this church. My friends, but King David still wants to know his end. Because he said in Psalms 39, 4, Lord, make me to know my end. Do you want to know when your life will end? And I am sure nobody wants to. I don't want myself. But if I know when my life will end, the more I will be under stress. But King David said, Lord, make me to know my end. <coughs> 17 years ago, I found a gadget that can compute how your end will come. You just punch in the date when you were born and then select whether you want 80 or 70. Put there if you are a male or a female, but during the time, they don't have any information about if a person is not sure about his gender. But anyway, when you, when you put whether you are a male or a female, when you press it down, voila, you will find the exact date when a person will die. But we don't believe in that, right? Why? Because James chapter 4, verse 14 tells us, we cannot promise about tomorrow, for tomorrow may never come. Right? For tomorrow may never come. My friends, we might have lived so many unwisely, they, and they so many unwisely during the past year. How can we recover those lost days? I think uh, we heard from our scripture reading that we can redeem the time. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, we heard it read to us in our scripture reading that we can redeem the time. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, it tells us, be careful as to how you live your life unwisely, redeeming the time. But uh, I am confused. Yes, two verses in the Bible talks about redeeming the time. I look in the dictionary, and redeeming the time, redeeming means compensate, or what? Compensate and buy back. We cannot buy back any loss of time. But the dictionary says we can compensate. And the only way I can understand how we can compensate the loss of time is by looking at my own sand in the hourglass of life. I wish I can bring this down there, but you can see the sand falling down. There is no more way we can redeem the loss of time that falls down here, unless we invert it back, right? But like Nicodemus, should we be put back in the mother's womb? No, we cannot do that. But the only way how I can understand in redeeming our time is to look at this sand of our sand glass of our life. It tells me that whatever remains here, we should make the most 
of whatever remains here. Right? Brother Dan, I see him. I, I see you nodding. We have to make the most of what is given to us. The present life. Yes, my friends, the gardener that we read about the parable that Jesus gave, he said, Master, give us the time. Give us the chance. And that is exactly what the Holy Spirit is giving to each one of us. The gardener most likely will put all the fertilizer, dig around the tree, water it down, and apply the TLC or tender loving care in order for the tree to bear fruit. Oh, yes, my friends, God is giving us grace. And for us who are ready to continue serving him, let us continue that opportunity of life or the gift of life that God is giving us. Apostle Paul is teaching us that we must learn to live today. You and I are called to make the most of our present, the gift of life. In Philippians 3.13, the Bible says, But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Last year, or everything that we have done in our lives, and reaching forth onto the things which are before us. That is what Apostle Paul is saying in Philippians. What we are facing today, my friends, this year of 2023, we don't know what comes next. But we know for sure what we have to do. Whatever events that we encounter, we can still be victorious through God's help. We remember what Jesus said, how to be victorious. Jesus said, I am the vine. In John chapter 15, verse 5, the Bible says, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. We must be connected daily to him. And as we open our eyes daily, receiving the gift of life, the present, we must be connected to him. Today, my friends, is a gift, and may we use it in redeeming the loss of time by using all the opportunities given to us by God. If we need decision to follow him, let us not delay. For our young people, I ask Brother Charlie to take some picture a while ago because I am very much encouraged with the young people that I can see in this church. You are the hope of this church. Use the time and stay connected with God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Our timeless investment for the coming year are under the leadership of our gentle new pastor. Let's work together in the finishing of God's work. Our timeless investment for the coming year, for this year, is to answer the question with a positive answer. How shall we stand for the time given us? How shall we stand on the great judgment day? i like to end this with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our precious, loving Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us the gift of our present as we live the Christian life. Give us, Father, the power and the strength to stay focused in you so that we may be able to press forward toward the goal of your high calling for each one of us. Oh, I pray that thou will help us to recognize when you bring us new opportunities so that we can make the most of whatever is left in our lives. We pray that the Holy Spirit helps us 
to always stay connected with you, that we may not lose our standing with you to bring honor and glory to our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. We humbly ask this in Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen.